My name is Michael Moon. I'm an uh, Associate Professor of Speech Communication at uh, Lone Star College, Kingwood. And I was asked to provide some of the structure for today's activity. And I, I do want to emphasize that this is an activity where you are going to be active in the final uh, minutes, of, or the, the final half hour, 45 minutes of this talk. And through your activity, we're going to get you guys out of here in time for, uh, for basketball. Um, before I talk about structure, I would like to uh, have you guys watch a video that introduces the topic of our discussion today. So if, if our video is queued up, we're going to look at the um, we're, we're, we're going to look at the substance of this issue about uh, dealing with economic inequality from a couple different uh, angles, and this might resonate. This, this video might might resonate with you as far as your stand on this issue and, and, and how you approach this issue. <coughs> And you're going to share your point of view with the folks at your table when we break off into groups and, and start the deliberation. So, if you work hard, shouldn't you be able to support a family and get ahead in life? Isn't that what we want to teach our children? Or is hard work not enough anymore? What if the system itself isn't fair? Or is throwing too many obstacles in our way? Can we adapt? What do we owe others? And what do they owe us? These are just some of the questions that come up when citizens talk about our uneven recovery from the Great Recession. The middle class is shrinking, and poor households are increasing. More than 45 million Americans are living in poverty, while the 400 wealthiest Americans are worth $2.4 trillion. The net worth of the average American household has dropped 40% since 2007, but the expenses most Americans have, like health care, child care, and college tuition have all steadily increased. To make America strong and prosperous, we need to make sure as many people as possible have opportunities to succeed. What can we do to make that happen? And what are we willing to accept in order to move forward? That's what we, as individuals, communities, and as a nation, need to understand in order to take action together. We'll be deliberating three options. These options were not developed by political parties or experts, but by talking to people throughout the country about their fears and hopes regarding our changing economy. We need to choose a strategy, or blend of strategies, based on what we hold most valuable. But we also need to consider the drawbacks of any strategy to make sure we can live with its consequences. So, let's look at our options. Option one says we should make it easier for people to start new businesses that will improve their circumstances, and we need to help existing businesses grow. There are more ways than ever for people to become entrepreneurs. They just need to be willing to take action on their own. In this view, more people could launch new full-time careers or side businesses that would introduce innovations and provide jobs. To help, banks could make more loans available to local entrepreneurs and small businesses. But not even half of new businesses will survive the first five years. That means a lot of lost investment for entrepreneurs and also for the banks that finance them. And if those businesses fail, what is our responsibility to the laid off workers? What if states, cities, and universities worked more closely with private companies to provide targeted job training this might allow growing industries to hire more workers, but when governments direct people into certain fields, both workers and taxpayers lose if the venture fails. The trade-offs to all these actions is that they increase the likelihood that some individuals will do better, but increase the risk in the overall system, and not everyone is willing or suited to be an entrepreneur. Can we live with this? Option two. This option focuses on securing and expanding safety nets so people who have lost jobs in our new economy don't face catastrophic losses. To do this, Congress could improve the unemployment benefits <laughs> program by raising unemployment taxes or permanently extending the length of time people can draw benefits. But raising taxes will cut into companies' profits. Temporary assistance for needy families is a program aimed at helping families in dire need. We could increase TANF funding and improve regulations to make sure state funds are actually going to needy families rather than to other programs. But 
unless we also raise taxes. This would increase federal oversight and divert tax dollars from related programs. With America's infrastructure in disrepair, one idea calls for governments to institute a jobs program like the WPA of the 1930s to put people to work building and repairing bridges and roads. But there are downsides to making it easier to cope with job loss. Even if we're not reducing the individual incentive to work, we may reduce the overall competitiveness and job growth of our country. And some of these actions make those of us with jobs more responsible for those without. Are we willing to accept this? Option three says we need to reduce inequality. Some say it's not right for CEOs to make hundreds of times more than their employees, even as the companies cut workers' hours to avoid paying overtime or benefits. We need to shore up the systems that make it possible for the vast majority of Americans to move up the economic ladder. For example, states and cities could increase the minimum wage to a so-called living wage that would cover families' basic living expenses. Individuals could organize or join unions to push for better wages and job security. But a significantly higher minimum wage could force some small businesses to close or lay off workers, and higher worker wages could make some companies less globally competitive. What if we changed school funding to make sure children from poorer neighborhoods receive the same quality education as those in wealthy neighborhoods, so that everyone really has a fair shot at achieving their potential. We could also subsidize college more so that students aren't graduating with huge debt. The downside of both of these actions is that wealthier individuals may end up paying more. In fact, all of the actions in this approach require more of the wealthy and could lead to less job creation. Can we live with that? These three options are the starting point for our conversation. Each offers a path toward economic security, and yet each has risks and trade-offs. If we want to get some level of control over our huge and complicated economy so that it provides some security for all of us, we're going to have to work together. That means finding some ways forward that we can all live with. We've got some hard choices to make. So let's get talking. introduction to the, the content of the issue we'll be discussing. What I'd like to speak about briefly is the process. And so in the next couple of moments, what I'm going to do is talk about the, the, the structure, the rules of deliberation. And then I'm going to hand it over to your moderators to lead it through this process that you'll complete over the next 45 minutes. Uh, what we'll do is you guys are going to introduce yourselves. You're going to discuss your personal stake relative to this issue at hand. You'll talk through each of the three options, and then you're going to do some individual reflection. You're going to complete some surveys that we have at each table. And before you hand those surveys to us, we'd like you to share what you wrote down with people at your table um, to, to facilitate a, a brief report out where someone at your table will um, to reflect on the scope of what was discussed today. All right, so let's talk about this process. What are deliberative dialogues? What do they look like? Deliberative dialogues lie at the inter intersection of deliberation and dialogue. When we are deliberative, we focus on critical thinking, rational judgment, uh, focusing on the logic and the substance of an issue. At the same time, we also engage in dialogue, which is fundamentally about developing relationships with people in our community. We listen to each other, we develop respect, we, we show respect, um, we develop trust among the, the people we live with, the people we work with, the people we see day to day. So as a component of the larger decision-making process, ideally, when we deal with our issues through deliberative dialogues, first we engage in dialogue, we develop relationships. Within those relationships, we look at issues in a way that's um, uh, critical, that's logical, that's rational, that's unemotional. 
And ultimately, we make smart decisions, decisions that help us meet all the things that we need, um, and that we can live with the trade-offs. Now, as we commit ourselves to deliberative dialogue, um, there are some, some roles that we need to attend to. There are also some rules that we need to follow. So, so let's talk a little bit about those roles, and then we'll talk about those rules. So at each table, there are a group of people sitting there, and, and no one at your table is just along for the ride. If you're in this room today eating our food, <laughs> you're participating. And you know, let, 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 let's just emphasize this right out of the gate, that, that everyone's participation is valuable. It contributes something to the process. Um, even if we ultimately disagree, the points that you raise in disagreement with the rest of your table helps develop the, uh, the rest of the group's sensitivity to those trade-offs that are important for us to consider when we think about what do we need and what can we live with. All right, your moderator is going to designate one of you to serve as a timekeeper. The timekeeper needs to look, work really carefully with your moderator and with the MCs of this, uh, this event to make sure that we stay on track. I and mean, we are sensitive to time today. We do want to get you guys out of here in about 45 to 50 minutes. Um, so we have to guys introduce yourselves. Someone who's got a timing device, uh, maybe offer up your service as a timer, and then we'd like you to be ruthless in your attention to time and keeping the group on track. We'd also like someone to fill the role as a recorder. And if any of you brought a notepad, a, a tablet, a paper, we'd like you to take notes about the content that's being discussed as we discuss different aspects of this issue at hand. Where are the trade-offs? Where are the areas of agreement? Where also are the areas for disagreement? And periodically, the moderator should ask you to you know, double check whether or not an accurate account of your discussion is being captured. And occasionally, just like in the courtroom where we ask the court reporter to read back someone's testimony or read back some piece of evidence, the, the recorder at the table might reflect back, summarize the scope of what you've been discussing. And finally, the important role at your table, and I'd like one of my, my moderators once again, just raise your hands. We have moderators. These folks are trained to be moderators. Many of them are volunteering their time to provide leadership. Let's give them a big round of applause. Now, if you are at a table that, is, that does not have a moderator, we would like you to move to another table. And there are some tables that have a lot of people, a couple tables that only have a few. And so if, if you see some, some spots where we might need to you know, spread the room out a little bit, I'd, I'd like to really encourage you to move around. We have seven or eight moderators, and uh, we, we would like there to be you know, fair numbers at each table. So a table like this might maybe we'll get a couple of people to come over here. Um, maybe a couple of people over here might come to this table here, where, just where there's some open seats. There's, there's, there's room at these lesser attended tables for your viewpoint to be uh, listened to and valued. All right, now, one of the important things that your moderators have been assigned to do is to ensure that the rules of this deliberation are followed. There are 10 rules that I'm going to go over very briefly. The first rule, which I've already stressed, is that everybody needs to participate. Within this participation, we're going to emphasize um, sharing speaking responsibilities. So moderators are encouraged and, and, and they are required to make sure that no one's dominating the conversation. So uh, while, while, people, while people may have a great deal of passion for a certain viewpoint and, and a lot of great ideas about that viewpoint, uh, we do need to make sure that we are taking turns and uh, not letting one voice, one point of view dominate this conversation. The third rule is that we're going to practice active listening. When we listen actively, we take notes, we ask questions, we double check to make sure that what we think we heard is what the other person actually said. And so we're not going to superficially listen, we're not going to listen to play gotcha with other people, but we're going to listen with this goal of understanding. The fourth rule is that we're going to speak from our own experience. No one was elected to represent a group of people that are not here today. You're going to represent yourself. And you're going to talk about your personal connection, your personal uh, needs and hopes and aspirations relative to the issue at hand, but not speak for some abstract group or abstract special interest that's, that's not here today. Speak for yourself. Let's talk about the underlying assumptions that inform the positions you take. 
What are those specific experiences? What are those core values that inform your decision making and, and your sense of what is right and what is wrong? And let's talk about those assumptions. The sixth rule is that we're going to suspend judgment. And while we will dive into the issue at hand and, and consider a lot of options, we really shouldn't rush to fall in love with any one idea over the other. Not at first. A little bit later you guys will come to a decision, but don't come to a decision until after we've given everyone a chance to speak, given everyone a chance to understand you. The seventh rule is that we want to focus on the choices we might make relative to dealing with this problem of income inequality, and let's also think carefully about those trade-offs, the consequences that are inherent in any choice, even those really good choices that we might that we might initially start focusing on. The eighth rule is that going back to this idea of deliberation, we're going to speak to each other, not at each other. This is not a debate. This is not an opportunity for you to dive into a monologue and just for the sport of hearing yourself speak. Our communication is for the goal of building relationships and building an understanding. The eighth idea is that we're going to consider each option within this issue from a variety of different angles. Let's look for opportunities to uh, identify common ground and then build on that common ground. But let's not rush to an early consensus. As we start finding things that we agree on, let's explore those areas where we may disagree. And the final rule is let's maintain the spirit of deliberation. If, if, if anything happens today, my hope is that you walk away from your table Got, having got to know someone that's part of our community, someone that you might start uh, uh, maybe a friendship, maybe a working relationship with that, that, that's meaningful in your lives. Okay, um, if there are no questions, let's look at the, the format of your deliberation. What we'll do first is what's called a personal stake. And what your moderators have been asked to do is to lead the group for a five to ten minute sort of round table discussion where each of you take turns discussing your personal relationship to the problem at hand. And I'll tell you what, moderators, if your table finishes before this 10 minute time that we've allotted, throw your hands up, wave at Dr. Tice and I, and then we can move on to the next step in, in case we're, we're, we're getting this first part over efficiently. Are there any questions on that? Okay. Again, there's some open seats over here, so if, if anyone's feeling crowded at a table, uh, you might want to uh, maybe give me a little bit more breathing room, a little bit more room to, to talk and meet other folks. Uh, see some full tables over here, see a full table over here. Again, open seats up here, open seats at this table right here. Don't all volunteer at once, folks. Can we get a free ticket uh, for $300 to no. fly? <laughs>